Welcome to EFT Nation, your home for all things tapping. For show notes and resources, please visit EFTTappingTraining.com. We are your tapping hosts. I'm Alina Frank. And I'm Craig Wiener. The information provided in this podcast is not a substitute for counseling or medical advice. The information presented here is meant to inspire and educate listeners, but are not guarantees of any kind. And this is the EFT Nation podcast, and we have a very special guest today. We do. I am just thrilled to introduce and bring to you friend, colleague, and just person extraordinaire, um, Midge Murphy. So for those of you that somehow are in the EFT world that don't know who Midge is, let me just give you a little bit of a brief bio. Um, She's an energy healing practitioner. She's actually the first attorney to have uh, gotten her PhD in energy medicine, and she got that from Holos University. Midge has a deep understanding of both the law and alternative healing arts, which is so important. Uh, This allows her to lend her expertise as a bridge between those two worlds, the legal world and the energy healing world. For over 15 years, she's been providing consulting services to a multitude of clients in ethics, legal issues, risk management strategies, and the practice of and training in energy healing methods. She also know in 2015, she published a groundbreaking book, Practice Energy Healing in Integrity, The Joy of Offering Your Gifts Legally and Ethically. She updated that and expanded that, which was a lot of work, in 2020. I have my own personal copy, of course. She also developed an exam that's based on the book. So that provides practitioners with the opportunity to earn a certificate of completion and have that in their pocket. Since first published, the book uh, and the related exam have been recognized pretty much as the gold standard in the field of energy healing methods for this topic. And in addition, she offers her EFT tapping ethics and legal online certificate course. And that's been recognized as a gold standard for EFT tapping practitioners. Yeah. So that's just a little bit about Midge. I'll let her, you know, go on. We're, we're going to really cover today, just in this podcast, you know, we could talk about this ad nauseum like Mm -hmm. for days but this is just within 20 minutes we want to explore let's just start off with maybe the three top things that in all the consulting and work that you've done midge the three top mistakes that you see energy healing practitioners well, and specific, practitioners. yeah, specifically at EFT practitioners. Yeah, specifically Just, EFT. That. Because, that, because if you're energy healing and you're like touching the body, that's a whole nother thing. Right. So, right. <laughs> right. so uh, yeah, let's talk about the, the things that you see over and over again. So welcome, Midge. Well, thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. And it's always a pleasure spending time with both of you. And thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, let me think a little bit about that question, because there are actually a number of issues that come up when I think about that for EFT practitioners, having done this work for over 15 years. I think the first one that really hits home for me is the issue of what is your scope of practice as an EFT practitioner? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mistakes that are made out there. I think one of the assumptions that's made, and I talk about this in my book and also in the certificate course, is that... um, A lot of EFT practitioners believe that they are safe from prosecution because they are practicing within their scope of practice as it was taught to them either in their certification program Mm -hmm. or in their training. Mm -hmm. And I think that is um, that is a misleading uh, assumption because ultimately scope of practice is defined by the laws and regulations that apply to that particular practitioner. In, in the state in which they reside and have their practice. So or I con- think- Or country province, or province yeah. or wherever. Right, are, exactly, right? yes. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of EFT practitioners face. And I think what I'd like to address then is we, we've got two groups here. We well, actually have three groups. <laughs> we have non-licensed practitioners. And then as in a general sense, non-licensed EFT practitioners, their greatest risk in with regards to scope of practice is that they could be charged with practicing psychotherapy or medicine or another licensed healthcare uh, profession without a license. Mm. That is a crime in almost all states to practice uh, the unlawful practice of a healthcare, um, uh, you know, uh, service is a felony. And so we want to want to avoid and, and help and empower those non-licensed practitioners to be really careful about how they describe their services, what kind of title they use, and so that they are only using EFT within the scope of practice that they can legally do so in order to help their clients. So I think that's a key component. Um, so like <clears throat> an EFT 
practitioner, a non-licensed coach, so to speak, mm -hmm. if they're giving out nutrition, too much nutritional advice. That's right? yeah. Or if you. they're deeming to work with however it's, I mean, this is a whole nother subject is how is it deemed if they're doing psychotherapy? Right. But right. that's a bigger <laughs> conversation to have, but yep. that's possible. Right. Um, giving yep. them medical diagnostic advice or whether or not to take their medication would be. An, so, I mean, all those variations sure. would speak to what there, you're talking about, correct? Absolutely. There's tons. I mean, with respect to the nutritional piece, there are some states that do allow you to offer nutritional advice. It's not a licensed profession, but there are a number of states in which you have to be either a registered dietitian mm -hmm. or a licensed nutritionist in order to offer any kind of uh, nutritional advice. So that's, and so it really can, <clears throat> depending on the state, but as we know, if you're not a licensed practitioner and you have an EFT practice, then you're going to be working with people all over the country. And that's one of the benefits of being unregulated is that you can cross state lines and offer your services, but you have to be very, very careful around the description and how, what kind of issues you're working with. Yeah. The, another example that Craig said, talking about uh, medical issues, that there's, here's a really um, a tip in terms of EFT practitioners not licensed. You have to be very careful around the word pain, physical pain. Pain is considered a medical condition. Mm -hmm. So if you're on your website and you're working with people with physical pain, that puts a red flag over your head because you could be charged with practicing with medicine without a license. So the nuance of words I use with my clients is we never use the word pain. We may talk about physical discomfort or sort of the underlying emotional stress of dealing with a chronic health condition. So there's different ways you can frame it. You can approach it. That is definitely less risky than putting it out there. You're working with pain. And the other sort of general rule I like to give all my clients is, it's in my book, it's in my EFT um, ethics legal online certificate course, is you really want to avoid talking about any kind of DSM-5 disorders. Mm -hmm. Those, that's the book that lists all of the psychological disorders. And so licensing boards, regulatory agencies, if you are talking about anxiety, if you're mm -hmm. talking about depression, if you're talking about any kind of uh, PTSD, these are trigger words. And you're really not, as the general rule, non-licensed practitioners cannot work with people with any kind of a DSM-5 psychological disorder. That is considered practicing psychotherapy without a license. So you have to be very careful. You can certainly work with people that have limiting beliefs about themselves that are holding them back from maybe wanting to ask for a raise or have a better relationship or better boundaries. There's a nuance. It's a slippery slope sometimes, but you really want to be very careful. And ultimately, ultimately, you want to take care of your clients. And if you're not trained specifically in dealing with you know, heavy duty psychological disorders, you can cause harm to that client if you're not a licensed therapist. So it's always, I always kind of come back around in a big circle and say, that really, it's about taking care of our clients. Ultimately, that's our goal. And that's, you know, do no harm, but also having a, a really good client-centered practice where you're really taking care of your client in an ethical way with integrity. That's really important to me. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I really, I really like what you said about this particular mistake, because of the way that you framed it, that that you learn something in your training and uh, in the workshop or in your certification program, but don't make the distinction then of like, okay, where what is my scope of practice? I know that in our trainings, we spent, we spent time on it. And then in the certification, mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time and we also require your course for those who right. do our certification, but that's the minority. I think that, I know. that you, you can see out there so many things on the internet, um, courses that will have you do all kinds of things and say all kinds of things and cover things like PTSD and, and that, but don't put it into the context of, well, this really depends on your licensure, your skill level, all of those things. So thanks exactly. for framing it that way. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. there were three categories. So that's Non-licensed. Non -licensed. In every workshop right. and certification, there's yes. a mix of all three yeah, of these populations. Exactly. So oh, absolutely. Clarified. Yeah. And you know, just like you're saying, 
maybe you don't treat depression and anxiety, but all over your website, because there's research, it has anxiety, PTSD, and depression, because there's right. meta-analyses, et cetera. And if that yep. implicates or make it seem like you are doing that, right. that's a sticky wicket. Yes. Uh, yeah. it's, act, it's always a matter of perception. Yes. I'm always looking through the lens. How would a licensing board, a court of law, a regulatory agency perceive what you're doing? And right. so the nuances of the words are so critical. And also to have specific disclosures on your website, in your client agreement, making it very clear that you only offer your services within a framework in which you can legally do so and that you do not offer any kind of licensed healthcare services. And it's not a substitute for licensed healthcare services. Right. So I cover that very um, intricately when I work with my clients in terms of their websites. And so what you have to really remember is getting a certification, any kind of certificate is not a license to practice. Right. Having an academic degree is not a license to practice, license to practice. So even if you have a PhD in psychology, that doesn't mean you can practice psychology right. and offer your psychotherapy services to the public. So let's go to the second group that yeah, I work yeah. with a lot, and that's licensed healthcare professionals, especially let's talk about mental health care professionals. Obviously, EFT has wonderful application in psychotherapy itself as a tool. And so with the clients that I work with that are licensed mental health care professionals, um, initially, years ago, it was it was risky because EFT was not recognized as part of the scope of practice or part of the standards of care of psychotherapy. And so when a licensed practitioner you know, wanted to use this innovative, you know, energy psychology-based, energy-oriented, meridian-based technique, um, it was not well received by licensing boards. So the biggest risk that licensed professionals face is being subject to professional discipline by their boards mm -hmm. or a malpractice claim by a client for using mm -hmm. something that is not considered part of the standards of care or is considered outside right. of the scope of practice as it's defined by their laws and regulations. Yeah. Now, the good news is, of course, there's been all these great studies. It's been around now for over 20 years in terms of kind of, you know, ASAP, I think it's going to have their 25th anniversary coming up. So that risk is, um, is reduced somewhat for licensed healthcare professionals. So they, and the thing that I could offer right here is there's something called the respectful minority defense. So if their licensed board came after them and said, you are using a technique, a therapy that is not accepted in our standards of care. Um, you can re reply and say, look, there's, there's an association that's been around for 25 years. There's all this research that's been done. It's been demonstrated that there's hundreds, if not thousands of practitioners who've helped thousands and thousands of clients. So that's proof that there is some value, therapeutic value to EFT in uh, the application of psychotherapy. So I think that's a really strong argument. I talk about that a lot in my book and in the course. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's where I think a licensed practitioner can get tripped up. They can say, well, I went to a conference. I think this tapping is great. I'm going to start using it in my practice. Well, <laughs> they're setting themselves up for a malpractice claim yeah. because it's not... You, from an ethical standpoint, going to a weekend workshop does not demonstrate that you have really learned and are competent in a particular technique. So that's why I always encourage all of my clients who are licensed, say, if you're going to really want to use EFT tapping in your practice, you need to be certified. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's all these different levels of certification. And of course, in my book, you guys are the gold standard in what you're doing. And there's several other, you know, really good programs out there. So EFT Tapping Training Institute to me is like, that's top. That's the one I always recommend because I know so well how well people are trained in that program. So I think that's what I really encourage to reduce their risk is that they become certified um, because that way they can demonstrate, yes, I've been certified. I have so many hours. I've you know, demonstrated that I have met the requirements to be a competent and properly trained EFT practitioner and incorporated in my practice. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that's really, that's the advice that I give for those that are licensed mental health care professionals. Now let's talk about allied health care professionals. Um, so let's, let's talk maybe I cut two one, two, let's talk about a physical therapist. Now physical therapists 
EFT would be great for them because they're dealing with people who are recovering from all kinds of injuries and illnesses. So they're dealing with a lot of pain and treating pain is part of their scope of practice. Right. So I think it'd be very, um, as an adjunct a technique to help deal with the emotional stress of the pain and helping the body balance itself and, and heal itself. And I think that's a really good um, therapy technique to bring into a physical therapy practice. Again, the same thing would be for a PT that I would say for a, you know, a licensed mental health care professional, become certified, make sure that you can demonstrate to your board that you have are fully qualified and trained in using EFT with your physical therapy patients. And the other one I'd like to mention briefly, because this is one of my scenarios in my book is <clears throat> I was, I'm a therapeutic touch practitioner. It was the very first energy healing technique I, I learned as a hospice volunteer a long time ago. And so Obviously, nurses could really benefit from using EFT and tapping um, with patients because we know it can calm them down, especially if they're stressed about having surgery or just recovering from surgery. Mm -hmm. It can be a great tool as a nurse to help them or maybe deal with uh, maybe they have uh, diabetes and it's a way to reduce the stress so that their, their blood sugar level is better. So it's, a, it's an adjunct tool to really help balance and calm the nervous system so that the patients feel better. Now, the trick with that is that we have to be careful. So if the nurse was doing some tapping with, let's say, a, a patient who was recovering from heart, open heart surgery, and in tapping, they tapped into an, an event came up and revealed that that patient suffered from some, maybe some sexual abuse earlier in their life. Now, at that point in time, the nurse is not a psychiatric nurse, not qualified to work with sexual abuse. Right. Then if that nurse started to work and use tapping on the sexual abuse issue, right. that's when that nurse would be practicing outside of their scope of practice and below their standards of care. And they would be, could be subject to a negligence or a malpractice lawsuit or lose their license. Yeah. So that's when the nurse would say, oh, you need to see a psych psychiatric nurse or a psychologist or something, some referral that protect, you know, that really works with that patient with that particular issue. Yeah. So that's kind of a broad scope with um, the scope of practice between all these different kinds of practitioners. And it's, it's a slippery slope, um, but I'm here to empower my clients to make, you know, so they can practice with integrity and feel good and feel as safe as possible going out there and offering their services to the public. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate that about you. All right. So what's number three? Number two. Oh, I thought we covered two. No, one was scope of practice. Okay. We're yeah, still scope of practice. And that was a big one. Okay. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah. You're right, Craig. We could like take, we could take like four days on that. Those are just some general rules. Um, the other one that I'd like to talk about a little bit about is where people get tripped up a lot is the use of titles. And um what we have to be careful of, and maybe some people don't realize, again, you know, covering the laws and regulations, as a general rule, most healthcare practicing laws in this in all 50 states, let's take, let's take psychology, for example. There are two components to the law, licenses, psychologists. One is the title that the psychologist can use, and number two, the types of services they can offer to the public. So when you have someone who is non-licensed and they want to call themselves an EFT psychotherapist, an EFT, oh, yeah. EFT therapist, um, they already are in violation of the law because what, what these laws state, and let me give you an example. Here is Oregon's law. Um, I wanted to just briefly is talk about that. So Generally, state psychology practice acts restrict the use of the title of the words psychology, psychologist, or psychological to only those people who are licensed psychologists. Well, that seems pretty straightforward, but what does that really mean? In Oregon, here's the law, it means to use any title or description of services incorporating the words psychology, psychological, psychotherapy or psychologist. And that is typical of most states. Now, what I've come to know in the last year or so, maybe in the last year, I've had some students and clients come to me and they're calling themselves certified energy psychology practitioners 
Ouch. Or yeah, big time. Or energy yeah. psychology coach. And I, I have to tell you, I just, I, I almost fainted <laughs> because <laughs> they were un, totally unaware yep. that they were in violation right. of ev- almost every single psychology practice in the United States. And psychology boards are very um, aggressive mm-hmm. around people doing that kind of activity. I know they're not doing it intentionally. They're not aware. No. But think about how misleading that is the public. If you're yeah. if you're calling yourself an EFT uh, or an energy psychology practitioner, the perception is you are some kind of licensed psychologist. And yeah. so it does such a disservice to the field itself to use that mis this mistitling. And I think it's a it puts our whole field in a in a bad light. And I think it also puts these practitioners at great risk of being fine, they're not going to get thrown in jail, but they're going to they're going to be subject to fines, and they're going to be shut down. Their practices will be shut down. So that breaks my heart. Yeah. So I think there's some other words you have to be really mindful of, uh, and I talk about this both in the course and in, in my book. Is you have, don't ever use the word therapist. Okay, again, it's a matter of perception. If you call yourself a therapist, the perception is you're offering some kind of licensed healthcare services. Right. So coach is a safe word. Coach is not a regulated word. Um, and either is practitioner. So call right. yourself a certified accredited EFT practitioner. That's great. There's no worries about that. Yep. No um, violation of the law. Here's another one that's a little tricky. And so in some states, and for instance, I know for in New Jersey, it's in New Jersey, only licensed mental health care professionals can use the word counselor. Mm-hmm. So I know there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm an EFT counselor or I offer counseling services. Again, that is a very, um, that's a very borderline, tricky, risky word to use because, but the thing is that you may be in California and you're using the word counselor and you go, well, I don't care what happens in New Jersey. Well, you better because you're offering your services across state lines. So you're subject to the laws and regulations in New Jersey, even though you have your practice in California, because you're working and offering your services anywhere in the United States. Right. And Canada is similar. I've worked with a lot of um, people in Canada as well. I've been my clients that are EFT practitioners. And so they also, there's not that much of a big difference between the U.S. and Canada in terms of how psychotherapy is uh, regulated. So you just have to be really mindful of of the title that you use and know which titles are safe to use and which titles Mm -hmm. can get you into hot water. And uh, I I really have been wanting to address this issue that there's some people call themselves energy psychology practitioners and energy psychology coaches. And that makes me, it makes me sad. And it makes even, me nervous. Even, for I've even heard energy psychologists. <laughs> oh, dear. I've even heard yeah. that. So, yeah, <laughs> it's just that they weren't taught properly uh, how to how to really, you know, manage their legal risks. And, and yeah, that's exactly. What I think the key is on all of these yes. is we're reducing risk because anything right. can happen anytime and anything cannot happen for a long time. Yep. You can exactly. get away with something for years and yep. thinking you're yep. not free and then all of a sudden. Yep. Right. You get that cease and desist letter. Risk. <laughs> yeah, we can't, you know, we are pioneers. We're out there offering these unique services to the public as, as energy healing practitioner. I'm a therapeutic touch. Do a lot of, I've been a student of shamanism for many years, do a lot of shamanic pra- practices with my energy healing work. Trained in matrix energetics, certified in that particular modality. So, yes, we're pioneers and we're not really very well accepted into the mainstream healthcare industry. And so I think that's, you know, my goal is to provide education and services so that we can move the field forward. Because I believe it's essential that we're not going to move forward as a field and be accepted in the mainstream healthcare field until we have come together as a, as an industry or as a field in which, you know, people are properly trained and have had you know, education around the legal issues and scope of practice, because ultimately it's about protecting our clients and making sure that they're safe and get the services and the help that they, that they need and we can offer to them. Absolutely. All right. What's number three? Number three. Okay. The other one is kind of, it does tails a little bit, but a lot of uh, what, let's talk about websites for just a couple of seconds. Okay. Um, I would say, and there's a whole chapter in my book on website because it's a big topic, is that I would say over 90% of 
websites out there that offer services for EFT practitioners, more particularly for non-licensed practitioners, are in violation of state laws <laughs> and are in violation of Federal Trade Commission rules and regulations about advertising your services to the public. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about the issue of using a title on your website mm -hmm. and also how you describe your services. Um, the other piece is, let's talk a little bit about the Federal Trade Commission. So the Federal Trade Commission is a regulatory agency that oversees how services are advertised to the public. And so, and they um, have a special task force just looking at people who put out information about any kind of new modalities or, you know, you can get, you can heal from this so quick. And so they've really targeted I'm telling us, and they've targeted people that say, oh, you know, we can offer you this really quick weight loss program um, because what the FTC, F FTC requires is if you're going to make any kind of claim about your services and what people can uh, expect to receive from your services, you have to have competent, reliable, scientific proof. And that is double-blind, placebo-controlled human clinical trials, a testimonial of a happy client is not scientific proof. And so a testimonial is, is cannot be used to validate or meet FTC requirements right. that you have competent and reliable scientific proof. So the FTC has a lot of information about the proper use of, of uh, testimonials and claim from clients. And I, I address that specifically and extensively in the EFG certificate course and also in the book because it's so, so important. Because guess what? This is where you are. You are out there on the internet with your website right. and everybody can see you. And so that's where you have your your greatest risk is how are you advertising your services? What kind of title are you using? You know, what kind of claim are you making about your services? And, you know, what are you, what are you doing about your testimonials? And there's certain disclosures that you have to make when you use testimonials on your website. And so, and that's why I work with that with when I do audit the websites. Now, with respect to licensed healthcare professionals, you also have to be very careful if you have a website. And that is because some licensing boards, your regulations, your administrative rules, your laws, you're not even allowed to use testimonials on your website. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. I mean, if you're licensed, um, you have to know what the rules and regulations are. There might be very strict rules around how you can use a client or patient testimonial on your website, including have a testimonial release form that's signed. So again, it's the nuances. What's, what are the laws and regulations that apply to you when you're advertising your services to the public? So I think, um, yeah, this, it's, there's a lot to think about. It's all quite doable. Oh, the other thing I want to mention briefly is I work with a lot of licensed mental health care professionals who are wanting to sort of not do psychotherapy so much anymore. They want, don't want to be restricted to just doing psychotherapy with patients. Mm -hmm. So they're wanting to branch out. And I said, well, great. Let's talk about having a separate coaching practice. Right. And we have to, you have to be, do it very mindfully. You have to be very careful. You have to say, even though I am a licensed psychologist in the state of Illinois, I'm only offering my services as an EFT practitioner, as a coach. And you make it very clear that you're not, not going to be working with any kind of psychotherapy or psychological disorders, but only those uh, issues, limiting beliefs, help people feel better about themselves, you know, doing coaching, planning, strategizing about, you know, the things that they want to accomplish. And of course, that's a great niche for someone who already has a background in psychotherapy as a licensed practitioner, work as an unregulated coach, and that way they can work across state lines. But again, the disclosures are important. You never have patients when you're non-licensed or acting as a, as a coach. You are only have clients and you never offer treatments. You only offer sessions. Again, you want to just stay very clean so that there's no perception made that you're offering any kind of licensed healthcare services. So, but it's all doable. You just, you just have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. BB agrees. Yeah. She said two thumbs up, Mitch. Yay. <laughs> Well, you're just, uh, you're just such a wealth of information and we always feel like we just can't get enough information to give to our students. And so we decided to poll our community and the question that they really wanted like a whole webinar on was this idea of what if 
we end up getting licensed? What if we end up getting regulated beyond what we have right now? Um, what's going to happen? And so mm -hmm. you graciously agreed to do a webinar for us, and that's on October 1st. Perfect. Yes. Can't yeah. wait. <laughs> yeah. Cause I think it's a big question that's kind of looming and um, yeah. it just needs to be addressing. Uh, yeah. Like what kind of preparations can we make? What right. are considerations for people looking at going to the field that need to know about that? We can't predict the future, but we can watch trends. Yeah. yeah. Right. So definitely. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. There's yeah, a lot so of great information. And I want to really give people a good solid foundation of the historical aspect of what are licensing laws about? Why are we even thinking about this? What's yes. what the heck, you know? Mm, yeah. So I really want to give people a good perspective and a foundation as to, um, you know, as the field mo moves forward towards, you know, it's not really a question of if it's going to be regulated. It's yeah. a question of when. Exactly. And I we're have gonna the same and feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that and how to best prepare and give people an understanding of the core regulatory value of why it's looking like this is the trend and we're moving towards it. And so to feel empowered about it and not afraid of it. Yes. And, and so, yeah, just give some people some really good education and background about this topic. Good. So we will have the link to the uh, to the event in the show notes. And that's going to be, again, October 1st. And if you're finding it set this somewhere else other than our website, you can go to efttappingtraining.com and it'll be in the events section. So you've just been an incredible source of great information today. I know that I'm going to be listening to this again and again. And so will the listeners. Thank you so much, Midge. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. It was an honor and I, I can't wait to meet with you guys again on the 1st of October. Thanks for joining us today at EFT Nation. And remember that you can find show notes and previous episodes at EFTTappingTraining.com.